Hello, guys. Brian, Ron, hit your videos, Hello. please. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Huh? <laughs> hey, Brian. How are you? We've known How you guys do ones in Connecticut, years. ones in Santa Monica. That's it. That's it. Good to see you, nice even virtually, see, even uh, nice to Zooming. See you. Yes, I <laughs> wish we could all be together. Um, my first question is, how do you keep it all going? I just read you guys are now doing a, a live music TV show. Your, your movie, Ron, looks like an Oscar winner. I mean, I don't want to touch too little or too early, but <laughs> well, wow. thank, well, thank, how do you thank guys you. keep going like this? <laughs> well, we love stories. We, you know, we just, and they're all, you know, stories, as you know, Hawk, they're all sizes, shapes, and forms. And we just get excited by it. We still kind of live in the ethos of the ro the romance of old Hollywood, uh, you know, for you and for us, which kind of began the late 70s, early 80s. And it just turns us on to wake up to trying to puzzle solve the stories all the time. <laughs> so that that's kind of how it works. And we're both very driven, very dri different kinds of personalities, real driven guys, very competitive, want to, you know, do good work. And yeah. I would I would say, Hawk, that it's also a time where, you know, it, on a cultural level, the world's getting sort of smaller. There are more ways to see more kinds of stories from all over the world that really suit particular audiences in really specific ways. And I think for us, that's incredibly liberating because it opens up more possibilities to really talk to the audiences in, in a more direct, what, personal way. And we're always character driven, first and foremost. So I think we're both finding this uh, exciting and we're attracting great collaborators. And, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a thrilling. Well, now, Brian, you had said, you know, you guys are different. I've always wanted to, the old saying, opposites attract. Can you guys talk about how, describe how you guys got together? And as you do that, Ron, I'm, I saw somewhere you told a great story about casting uh, Night Shift which was pretty funny, but maybe you could start with how, how you guys got together and does do opposites attract? I'll start with how we got together. Um, I was on the Paramount lot. Um, I just produced some movies for TV that did well. Ron was starring in Happy Days, but also producing uh, and or directing uh, movies for TV as well. So I was on the third floor of the director's building which as you know, was right above your legendary father. Yep. <laughs> um, and that was it, was, it was really a landmark building between your dad and Robert Evans and many others. So I was there and I had this discipline of every day trying to create a curiosity conversation that would enrich in me. And so I looked out the window and I see Ron Howard and I'm thinking, oh my God, that's who I should talk to today. <laughs> I should talk to Ron Howard. <laughs> and so I yelled out the window, hey, Ron, Brian Gray, you know, like I waved like that, just, you know, you know, kind of slightly obnoxious, but I wanted to get his attention. And he just, he was busy and he zoomed around a building and, it, you know, vanished. And then I thought, well, that can't be the end of that. Um, I'm going to call his office. And I called his office. He had an assistant who we had, who we had for then and now for 40 years named Louisa. And I explained, I'm Brian Grazer, I'm a producer on the lot, really love to meet your boss and just have a, and so we, we then met uh, in my office and had a Hollywood lunch. <laughs> and that was the beginning. And when you say Hollywood lunch, even though I'd grown up in the business, in front of the cameras, going back to the Andy Griffith show and whatever, weird, and even though I was producing TV movies and, and beginning to direct, I had actually as after the lunch was over, I realized, oh, that was a Hollywood lunch. I'd actually never had one of those <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I the one thing is while I was getting things made and I enjoyed producing and directing and that was my dream to do to do more of that. I was I was the furthest thing from a, an insider and a real, uh, you know, in terms of understanding the system. And yeah, Brian and I are different. He's a real extrovert and I'm an introvert. And, you know, and we we live our lives, have different sensibilities in some ways, but we have far more in common than we, than, 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 than we have apart and that we do love stories and we like to work and we like to get things done. But I began to recognize in Brian, not only did he have for, for his age, 
a really mature sense of how the business worked, of how, how, how decision makers, how gatekeepers opened gates and decision makers said yes. And he had good creative ideas. So he wasn't, he wasn't like an agent who decided to be a producer. He was a storyteller, but he didn't seem very interested in directing. He wanted to get projects going. So in a lot of ways, we were very, very like-minded, but I had been trying to get features off the ground at studios and direct a feature. I'd done one for Roger Corman, very short schedule, very, but a, a lot of TV movies and I was making headway, but not being offered interesting things. And Brian not only had good ideas, but he just knew how to, 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 uh, to reach it, people and put, put, the, put the right, put people's minds in place to actually make a thing happen. And I, I thought it was uh, pretty remarkable. And we had the first project that we took out together, we didn't sell, but it was a great creative experience. And the very next one turned out to be Night Shift. And it was, uh, and that was, even though we didn't form Imagine for another five or six years, that really was the beginning of, of the partnership. Well, now let me ask you a question, Ron. When you were in, when you were doing uh, Andy Griffith's show and then Happy Days, when you were acting, when you were like sitting on the set waiting for the net, were you looking around at, at Gary Marshall or the other director, Jerry Paris? I remember Jerry so of well. Of course. You know, oh, I, I really was. I really was. Why am I in front of the camera? I'd rather be back there. It, it, it really started as a kid because two things. One, while my dad never directed film, he did write for television, Flintstones and other shows. <laughs> and uh, and and he and he also was directing plays all the time and things like that. And so he he we had a you know an an, um, an improv group that met at our house. So I was always kind of getting a behind the scenes look that way. But on the set of the Andy Griffith Show, I was so fascinated and with everybody, and I befriended everybody in every department. And I really was fascinated by these people and they'd show me what they were doing. And I was learning about the camera and I thought it was great. Um, I loved hanging around with the actors and the writers would come in and I was allowed to be a part of the problem solving. And at a certain point, the great legendary Howard Morris, uh, you know, from our show of shows, he played Ernest T. Bass, the crazy guy who would throw rocks through the window. But he also directed some of the episodes and was even nominated for an Emmy for one of the, uh, several of the episodes that he directed with, for us. And he, when I was about eight or nine, he said, you are so curious about all this, you're gonna wind up being a director. And it planted that seed in my mind. And really, I always was intrigued. And people like Jerry Paris and Gary continue to inspire and inform. And, uh, and I didn't really ever have a, per, a performer's personality. I, but I did enjoy the idea of, of leadership and telling the complete story, not just through one role. I got to work with your dad. Don't know if you know this. No. I was the assistant director on Chinatown. Oh, no kidding. In Chinatown. <laughs> you know. I, yeah, he had yeah. a great scene there. I loved that, yeah. yes. So, uh, In fact, every time I see Jack Nicholson, he says, hey, you're Rance Howard's kid. <laughs> well, I, just a quick story that both of you will really appreciate that I love is we were doing Chinatown on the Desilu side of Paramount on one stage. We were doing the My Sister, My Daughter scene. On the next stage, we, uh, Schlesinger was shooting the premiere for Day of the Locust in front of the Chinese theater with all those extras and everything. Okay. And right across the street, Coppola was shooting Godfather II with the Senate hearing room. And we all broke for lunch at once with different eras, different wardrobe. Obviously, Schlesinger, Coppola, and Polanski were, you know, at the top of their game. And as we're walking, Nicholson elbows me and says, hey, Bullhorn. He called me Bullhorn because I never needed one. <laughs> he said, hey, Bullhorn. He said, he said we're in Hollywood. <laughs> You know, it was like Sunset Boulevard when she yeah. pulls into. into wow, the great story. And we were, you probably, you guys weren't paying attention, but over on that other side of the lot was, uh, you know, Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley going on. And Henry Winkler and I would wander around and look at these sets. We snuck on the Godfather set. We, you know, we were, we tried, we tried to get on your set, got booted out. You wouldn't let us. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, that was great. Um, now you guys have had plenty of ups and I'm sure a few downs. 
there's got you, you can't just you didn't win yeah. 100 was there ever a time where the two of you just went looked at each other and went now nah, let's go our separate ways oh oh well, that's a good no one asked yeah. that question yeah no one ever did but mm -hmm. no i mean from my perspective no because because and it was part of what was exciting about being with a company and also a partner frankly you know somebody who's rowing in the same direction that um we had one rule that was you know sort of well we did say it we did articulate it at some point it's never been written down it's not an edict but but it was that um you know we would be honest with each other and tell each other what we thought but if one of us was passionate enough to go ahead the other one would fall in line and support that project and we've stuck with that we've always done that so sure we've had misses and some of them are pretty painful and but you know i've the other one's always bolstered the, the other and picked it up and the other but here's the other great part about about the company is we've never put all our eggs in one basket creatively because it's not our nature so there's always that next thing to work on the next thing to that to tackle that gets your attention right away and um, and I think it, it makes that healing process a little easier. What would you say, Brian? Uh, no, I thought that was well said. Um, no, we've never said, hey, let's go. No, we haven't done that. And as far as failures, definitely. Um, they used to hurt much more uh, in the first 20 years of our career because I, th I think vis there was fewer there was there's fewer uh, movies being made less content and they all had a lot of visibility so if you failed it was very visible and if you succeeded it was very visible you really as you remember hawk you're just kind of walking this tightrope and people some people are hoping you fall and other people aren't <laughs> and uh uh Fam but uh, Famous moment for me, I was sit sitting at the premiere of Chinatown and two major producers were sitting in front of me and 45 minutes in, one looked at the other and I heard them say to the other, ha, Evans has a bomb. And it's ha. the worst part of our business. Oh, yeah. wow. 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 I hope everybody makes a movie that everybody wants to see because if the audience loves your movie, they're gonna wanna go see mine and they're gonna yeah. wanna see the next person. Yeah. But what's so great about that is look how wrong they were. And, yes. and you know, and, and we, you know, everybody thinks they know, but nobody knows as the great Bill Goldman said, you know, uh, right. nobody knows anything. Right. So Brian, let me ask you again, you're a driven producer that I've known forever. Give me, give me your, you wake up. Do you go right to the computer? Do you get on the phone? Do you go go to the gym? Tell me a little bit of what your day is like. Okay, uh, I'm usually up at five thirty. I light candles in this room that's like a living area. You know, it's like a family room, but it's it's very nice. So I light candles. I create an ambiance where I can think. You know, and I I first quickly go through three or four newspapers, just easily, quickly, like anybody, the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and then maybe some trade or the, or the New York Post, you know, something kind of juicy and silly. And then, um, and then I go to, I purely want to know, then I usually go to YouTube and I go to my subscriptions and I find something that's going to be thoughtful and edifying, you know, in the way that's going to create some enlightenment. I'm not trying to tell you that it's profound enlightenment, although sometimes it is, but it's just something to an elevate my, the way, you know, the way I'm thinking and feeling, you know, in the, in the area of just like the dimension of enlightenment. And that, and that sort of makes me feel like, wow, I have, I can enrich in the projects that I'm doing, you know, kind of based on the 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 energy that I've uh, that I've actually elevated myself to. <laughs> that's kind of what I do for about an hour. That's that's it's fabulous. It just thanks. And, and Ron, and, and, Ron, and well, coming Ron, coming no. out of that, I just have to say, as his partner, he hmm. then starts emailing or calling. Because yeah. uh, usually he's really stimulated then, you know, and, and yeah, he does have true. 
so he he's suddenly kind of applying what he's been feeling for the hour that he's getting going and looking and uh and and usually it stimulates some connection um mm, thanks and, uh, now are you are you up late or do you get a full eight hours sleep or are you a uh, not much sleep um i'm sleeping a little more than i used to i used to sleep like six and a quarter hours and so i'm between six and a quarter hours and seven like i look today because i have a sleep app i i slept seven and a half hours and that was like remarkable <laughs> i was very excited about that so you know it's between six and a quarter hours and seven and a quarter to you know seven and a half hours and ron what's your day like yeah, let's hear. Well, it depends a lot on what I'm doing. Uh, you know, if I'm directing, that's on, you know, that's really not, in the trenches, that's a, that's a different thing. But when I'm not directing, I wake up in the morning pretty early. Uh, sometimes I can sleep till six, you know, 6.15, but but usually it's five, 5.30, um, sometimes earlier. And I've given in to the idea that, hey, if I, if I wake up at two and I'm just awake, don't fight it get up and do something and use that time and then go back to bed and which I sometimes do. And, and I just rather be mellow about that and just, and just get some work done. So I use that time and I use it for kind of urgent focused problem solving, like things I need to communicate. I, you know, uh, uh, I, I need to make a schedule. I need to understand what the day is really going to be. Uh, and I, and, and, you know, that's where I kind of make my lists and my problem solving questions come to mind. And I get, I use that time when I'm really alert to be very specific about th problems, creative problems or business problems that I've been thinking through and working on. Uh, and because the rest of the day is going to be a little more of a reaction. So whereas Brian is kind of looking at that, that giant overview, I tend to get pretty myopic first thing in the morning uh, and stay that way for a, a while and then I'll start to face the, the, you know, the broader day. And I try to work out in the morning too, if I can. Cool. So let me ask you, you guys have, you've always said, and I agree with you, no matter what new technology is around, it's all about story and it's all about storytelling. Um, I don't know that there's many younger people on this, but I know there's a lot of people who have children and grandchildren and I, I love to ask the question, uh, for younger people, uh, what advice would you give, what would you give, would you, for upcoming producers and directors, would you uh, still emphasize technical or only the story or both? And, and do you think there's a, still a benefit of going to film school? Um. A benefit of going to film school, yes, I do think there's still a benefit of going to film school uh, because it exposes you to all the tools. If you build a story, well, actually, I teach a class, which Ron knows at USC. Uh, I can't, I try to do it once a year, but I, it's called starting from zero, which is like, which is what producers often have to do. They start with nothing at all, and then they have to touch the paintbrush to the paper and then start painting and be prepared to rip up the painting, start over. But basically, starting from zero is like building a story out of a subject or a character or a nuance or, or uh, an insight, you know, something that actually speaks to you. Uh, so, so I think what you got to do is, I mean, I just feel, you know, this is, I feel very strong about this. I feel like you have to be very interested as a human being, very interested and use your interest to find out, to learn, be curious, use the engine of curiosity. And, and then with that, two things will happen. <laughs> you will, um, you'll become a more interesting person, which is way more attractive to other people. So, you know, you, you wanna be the person that when someone says, what are you doing or what's up or who'd you meet? You want to have it. You, you want to be the person with an answer. Um, and then you want to think through, like, I'm still pretty systematic because I do lots of curiosity conversations, but I do write down, what did I learn today? Only one or two things. I go to a dinner party or even a lunch, believe it or not, 45 years later, 
since I started these conversations, I write down the two or three things that I learned or the two or three people that I met or some insight. So I have something to say. I'm not dull. <laughs> wow. That's great, Brian. I, I, I'm, I'm so, in awe I, and I mean uh -huh. that seriously. Oh, thanks. So I think when you when you have that uh, in you, um, you're in motion. And then once you're in motion, then for young people, yes, if you want to tell stories, you want to know the tools that are available. And then film school uh, would would be very valuable to learn about the available tools. And and then with a with a classroom setting or with the colleagues, you can then build a movie, you know, or a short movie. So if you don't have the money to do that, you can do it without all of that. But well, to, given the today, option, have, everybody's got an iPhone. Yeah, everyone's got an iPhone. Yeah. They all have a YouTube. They can throw it out. They can just a lot of alternatives. Ron, what do you think? Well, I, I, I think uh, I think film school is still very important, but uh, absolutely. And, and, and not only for the reasons Brian cited, but also because you know, it's not a singular art form, you know better than anybody, that it's really always a collaboration. And yes, yeah, somebody might be leading the charge or have the kernel of the idea and the inspiration to, to, to sort of be define the project, but it's always a collaboration. And I feel that, um, that the, the people you meet in a, in a, in a college environment uh, or it doesn't even have to be college. It could also be some kind of collective that you join or so, you know, but, but if you, if you begin to, to get your like-minded collaborators uh, in your life, I think that's a gateway to growth and, and success. But the, the couple of things that I think about is that, that young filmmakers, they, they need to understand story, absolutely. But, but really the key to story is our characters. And now, you know, I feel that if you have that curiosity and you, you think about people in a really focused way, people you know, or people you're curious about, um, and then narratives begin to take shape. And so I feel that if you, if you understand as you're learning the tools and as you're practicing by making, taking your iPhone and making a movie and editing it together on your laptop and all of those things, because whether it's movies or television, it's about feeling. And humans always help stimulate feelings of empathy, you know, between uh, bridges between the audience and the characters. But then it, you have to go one step further, which is <laughs> why am I feeling the way I'm feeling about this particular show or this particular movie? Because that begins to speak to your voice. You know, what do you respond to the most? Do you like being scared? Do you like laughing? Do you like crying? You know, and if you then have your curiosity about characters and your 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 desire to study um and understand the arcs of their life and then you begin to look at films and tv shows and sort of say what do i what moves me what makes me feel and then go deeper and start to re-watch that with sound sometimes with no sound and understand why it made you feel and that's when you start to get to the grammar of movies and television did the camera move in and you, then the person spun around and that startled you? Or was it the performance of the, of the actor or actress that made you connect and cry? Was it the music? You know, you, then you start to understand the language. And then if you, if you want to be a storyteller, now you know how to use those tools to try to support the moments that are about the characters, whether it's sci-fi, whether it's fantasy, animated, whatever it is. It always comes back to those those uh, those characters, and you mentioned hillbilly elegy. But I mean, what a joy to guide uh, Amy Amy Adams and Glenn Close, particularly through this really this um, emotional minefield that was inspired by real characters. But you know, but they had to find a bridge to themselves as well to help create these characters. And it was a really interesting you know directorial exercise. But it all comes back to character. Well, uh, Kathleen Quinlan is a dear friend of ours and, and is a neighbor. And I, I don't know if she's listening now, but, but uh, boy, does she say great things about you as a director. So. Well, she's, a, she's a great artist and a, and a, and a fantastic uh, person. Now, you mentioned all these different genres. 
Uh, Brian, do you have a favorite that if you, if you had to choose one that you'd rather go for, what, what, what would it be? Genre, you mean? Yeah. Comedy, drama, th horror, thriller, well, okay. Okay. documentary. So, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, um, I, okay. Given that I made and produced like 15, 16 years of comedies, um, I have a, bottom line is a really, really funny movie I like a lot. Anything less than that, I'd rather go to something else. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's just, it's hard to make really, really funny comedies, but there are some, and I love, I, I love all those, the great ones like that. Um, uh, I mostly like, the easiest thing for me to like and enjoy is something that are aspirational films. You know, the underdog stories, rag, rags to riches, the story of the outsider, you know, you know, that kind of, you know, real underdog story driven by a protagonist that a star that I or actor that I like uh, that I can inhabit. I like those the most. Ron, I think at, at this point in my life, especially where I'm moving quite a bit back and forth between documentaries and and uh, and scripted. I, uh, it is that sort of inspirational, true story. There's something about delving into those characters and what they faced and the ways that they were tested that I just, I find uh, fascinating for me. They satisfy my curiosity. And I find that audiences click into them when they, when they know it really happened. Somebody really went through some version of this. Uh, I, I think they, they connect. And again, I love, giving actors a chance to really soar and often those projects, um, you know, offer those opportunities. Yeah. Well, yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot of the movies that we've, that we've done, whether it's beautiful mind or, or eight mile frost Nixon, you know, American gangster, these things are all sort of based on reality and yet they create um, a lot of um, a lot of insight and empathy from audiences. So uh, Brian, you've written a couple of books. Uh, did you enjoy the process? Uh, the first one, I, I did enjoy the process, the one that's called A Curious Mind, The Secret to a Bigger Life. Um, yeah, I liked it because I wanted to get, I wanted to share or eliminate all these stories that I, and experiences that I accumulated over 35 years, basically, um, which are these unique curiosity conversations. So I, I did enjoy that one. The second one, uh, what I thought was really hard and I had to rewrite it a bunch of times. It was called Face to Face, The Art of Human Connection. Right, you were talking um, to an awful lot of different people. Yeah, yeah and I like, I like what it's, what it's about, the simplicity of the idea, you know, that, that uh, looking at somebody, really connecting to that person when you are looking and feeling and being present is kind of the Wi-Fi of human connection. That's the beginning. So I like that. Um, it just was harder to do. <laughs> and, and Ron, you've worked with every facet of our industry. Is there some person who surprised you and you went, wow, I wasn't expecting that? Uh, yeah, that's good. Let's hear oh, Wow, it. Oh, wow. Um, I like to ask good questions. I, yeah, I would, that's a really good question. I, a, cup, a couple of actors, I'll go into that. A couple of it's mostly actors i mean i'm I, occasionally i'm really blown away by you know a cinematographer's ability to come in and see a setting a scene and just have an idea about a, a way of approaching it that i wouldn't have thought of and i'm always i really love to create collaborations i'm not really just interested in loyal soldiers who do exactly what i tell them uh, i want them to i want to yeah, ultimately make it like some orange person <laughs> it, yeah unfortunately uh well that's why you in my opinion you don't want ceos to be president nor do you want directors because we're kind of dictators <laughs> and uh by by nature and it's you know i don't think it lends itself to that kind of uh leadership but i i love to create that spirit a spirit of collaboration and so you know it, it, that moment where you've got a big problem and you're all huddled up and you're trying to solve it 
and where the I, where the, the solution breaks through wherever it comes from i always find that really really thrilling to be around and sometimes it comes from surprising places as you would say you know maybe the key grip is the one who figures out you know some sort of a logistical problem or even a script problem but back to actors i would say russell crowe on beautiful mind surprised me over and over again as he understood the affectations of, of, of somebody who was going through psychosis, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, and, and actually modulated those. We worked very closely together to do this, but still he was creating constantly. That blew me away. One time I had to, we, we put, we cast Tom Hanks in Splash. It was his first movie and he was a sitcom actor at that point. He, and he was very good, but I always felt like he was really great when he had bits and stuff to do. Uh, but he wasn't that alive when the can't when when he didn't have dialogue. But he became a bigger and bigger star, and I was really appreciated his performances and everything that he was doing. And then, the very first or second day of Apollo thirteen, we had this scene where he's watching Neil Armstrong land on the moon, and it's a big party at his house. And it's just, I'm doing a wide shot. I'm just watching. And I suddenly saw that without a line of dialogue, what he was doing was so interesting. So I, I got the B camera to get off that group shot they were doing, come around, get a long lens and just be on Tom. And I didn't say anything to it, but I watched this moment unfold. And I realized this guy's become a major movie star because he doesn't need to be talking now. He conveys so much just through his presence. And you can see the the wheels turning. Last but not least, I got to say, you know, uh, I mean, it's not, I mean, the, the way Glenn Close created this character that she plays in Hillbilly Elegy kind of blew me away. I was there, I was a part of it, I was part of the research, but she's nothing like the character in life. She wasn't drawing on her from herself. She was, it was total creation. And when the, when the family came and visited the set, they all, they broke down. They were emotional because they almost, they felt like this woman had been so important in their lives who had been passed, had passed away seven or eight years ago was, was, was back with them. I mean, it was really uncanny and that, that surprised me. That was not the reaction I would expect from the family. And it, and it was, uh, you know, it was an amazing moment. Ryan, other than how good Ron was when you first met him, what, who <laughs> else surprised you in your life? Well, so many actors, actually. I was just thinking. It doesn't have to be actors. It could be a. You, I know you mentioned somebody was very influential in your life at one point. Uh, who was that? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I watch you do it. Um, so did anyone shock me? Um, What's well, funny? I, well, I'll do the Russell Crowe as well. You know. Um, He'd already won an Oscar. He's brilliant. He was brilliant in our movie, A Beautiful Mind. And I was so down on my luck to try to make this one movie called American Gangster. And I asked Russell, would you please be in it? You know, because I had to cast it and I already had Denzel Washington, who was awesome. And I'm asking him to play a role that didn't, wasn't even written really, didn't exist. And as tough and, and unpredictable as Russell is and was, I was shocked that he actually said, yeah, I'll do it with you, mate. I'll figure it out. A and I thought, wow, what a crazy, and actually I haven't told that story. It was just such a huge leap of faith based, I guess, based on experience together where he trusted us that it would, that it would, that it would materialize. So, that was good. And I, I always was blown away by the magic of Jim Carrey or Eddie Murphy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, because the scripts were that they all did and they were all hits mostly. Uh, they kind of were, uh, were always just okay, but they, the, the way they, they could elevate them so far that it transcended what I could really understand. And, uh, they're kind of savants, very different people, Eddie, of course, and uh, Jim, but they're it, just the magic that they could create was awesome. So 
Yes. Tell me about the most embarrassing moment you've each had on. <laughs> I'll start. I start. So <laughs> I was <laughs> back to Jim Carrey and the Grinch, which was a tough, really tough shoot. A lot of mechanical stuff kids, people, these makeups that took hours and hours to put on. They were even like weighing Jim Carrey down and psychologically kind of like like creating a, a barrier for him. But he was heroic the way he would overcome these, this, you know, him just feeling horrible and create this amazing physical comedy. But at it reached a point where we had three different units shooting. And one of them, so I would be popping around from stage to stage to try to touch base. Now, one of them had this slope. It was in the, the, the Grinch's layer. And so you kind of walked in this, this sort of trying this, this circular way up to the, his kind of throne. And it was a very narrow walkway. And we had this giant monkey, you know, that was supposed to, it was like a giant, uh, pup, you know, uh, doll. Yeah. But it was tall. It was about eight feet tall. And the way they made it work was the special effects guys had a long pole, a long metal pole that was, you know, about four feet, five feet, about five and a half feet off the ground. And then they would just move it. That's how they'd make the monkey play. So I'm there with my shot list and I've got to run up to check a camera position. And there's really almost nobody on the set right now because it's the next thing that we're moving to. So I've raced from one unit over to here. Now I've got to just check this out. I'm staging, I'm looking around. Now I've got to get up high and have a look and I'm racing and I'm looking at my shot list and all of a sudden, bam, my feet are taken out from under me because I walked into this pipe <laughs> and it was like a cartoon. I fell right on my ass, just boom. Oh boy. <laughs> I looked around <laughs> and there was, there was one PA just kind of sitting there. It was kind of a sign to keep track of me with his walkie talkie. And he's kind of looking at me and I looked at him and I said, all right, I'm playing the director card, not a word. <laughs> 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 and uh, he kept his promise but now i now that it's over i don't mind telling the story right brian i'm sure you have had a couple many but I'll, I'll put them in the category similar category every time i act in a movie or tv show it's hugely embarrassing because i'm so shitty at it your beginning is too, by the way <laughs> yeah yeah i put your brother in wayne's world <laughs> oh yeah 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 oh yeah um so beginning with splash we we shot a scene that was in wall street it was a big scene with hundreds of extras all around and a taxi cab flips and you know what uh and ron goes why don't you have you know <laughs> version of why don't you be in the movie <laughs> so <laughs> I go, okay, I go, what am I doing then? Okay, all you're saying is taxi. So the taxi is gonna flip. So that now as the taxi's flipped, it's gonna be funny because you're asking for a taxi. So these hundreds of people all around, maybe, you know, many, many hundreds. And off to my right side, I remember the visual pretty well, is Tom Hanks and Daryl Hannah and John Candy. And the cab flips the thing. And I can't say taxi with the right intonation. I go, taxi, ta taxi, you know, like I don't have it right. <laughs> and, and I watched um, Daryl Hannah whisper over to, to Tom, he can't even say taxi. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm like, the, I'm supposed to be the big shot producer. So that that's embarrassing. It Pretty was embarrassing. Good. I had to act in Arrested <laughs> Development with Jason uh, uh, Bateman. That was terrible. I was in Entourage. I was all I had to do was walk across the street. They do it fifty times. You know. <laughs> so I, I had to develop a Have different you system. Retired from acting, Ron? Have you retired from acting? Who me, Ron? No, I'm sorry, Brian. Oh, you... Brian. I I think I could still get him to give it a go. Yeah, he could get me. Yeah, <laughs> I think he's matured into being with the two Oscars. Yeah, I think he can do it. He can I think I can get it out of it. I think I can. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> let, let's let's get serious for a moment. Okay. Because, uh, as you know, I used to be president of the academy, and uh, yeah, you've got a you've got a pretty interesting movie coming out. The two of you, Hillbilly Elegy, as you talked about. Uh, 
what is your feeling about the theatrical experience as opposed to streaming? And if, let's say, COVID hadn't happened, or let's say next year when hopefully COVID isn't around, uh, how do you feel about theatrical movies uh, winning Oscars, or should streaming be eligible as well? Tough question. Tough question. Brian? I, I, can, I can answer. Um, look, in the, in the optimal environment, I, you know, I love watching movies in theaters with, with people. And it really, it magnifies greatness, you know, emotion, it magnifies all that. Um, you know, absent being able to do that, or even, oh, you said absent COVID. So, um, if, no, Hillbilly I'm not, Elegy, if Hillbilly Elegy was just coming out, even though Netflix put it together, would you have been able to say to Netflix, hey, let's put it on the big screen oh, yeah. and well, later on you can run it yeah. on, your, on your streaming service? Well, they still, they, by the way, they still might. I mean, they're still hoping November 11th to put it yeah. into some theater. So the agreement always was that there was going to be a, you know, a limited uh, but fairly significant uh, theatrical release, much like they did with a few, a few movies last year. Uh, right. And I'm so I think, I, oh, go ahead. So go ahead, I think so. So I think streaming movies should qualify. Yeah. I'm not the guy that says, oh, you know, the only way to do it is this way, and and therefore you're not qualified. I mean, um, movies are movies, and technology has advanced, you know, the state of experience to a different to a different dimension, and not a better dimension necessarily, but to a different dimension. Do you think they also should be nominated for an Emmy if they're on television? The same film. I, I kind oh, of think. Oh, you mean oh, if you do, if you make a theatrical movie, okay. so it's called a movie, cost seventy million dollars, and should it be should it qualify for an Emmy because it's well, like if it's uh, streamed, right, on television. I guess I don't think that. I think no. maybe you would know better than I if there are any rules that define define the difference currently. I don't know that, but yeah, I. I, yeah, intuitively, I would say no, and yet it's a you know it's a really difficult question for the academy is because what it what is the what is the definition going to be? Yeah, so uh, you know, I'd say it, no to that too. But it may be the academy has always found its way. You know, there was a time when they had best black and white and best color, uh, and uh, you know, and I'm always for sort of. Uh, more categories in, in of films uh, so that you're so that comedies aren't necessarily competing <sighs> against dramas and that sort of and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's a, you know, my feeling about the Academy is it's a great tradition. It celebrates movies and you want to find ways to keep it valid, keep it viable. And because at the end of the day, it's not really about the contest. It's really about the showcase. And you want to do it with integrity, and that's what the Academy has always really been able to hang on to. And I and and uh, and I think it's I think it continues to be really important to global culture. In fact, that they that the Academy achieves that. Okay, so now we have Very a new Academy agree. rule. Right. Uh, I don't know if you've read about it, where in order to win Best Picture in uh, I think coming up in a year and a half. There must be uh, real diversity in your crew or in your cat. There's a set of rules that says, you know, in today's world, there must be diversity in, in order to be even eligible for Best Picture Oscar. What do you think about that? I, I think based on, and I haven't studied it really closely, um, but I, I think it provides a leadership on a, on a, on a, to the, to the creative community. And while on the one hand, don't necessarily like to see, you know, all of that framed up and shaped by, um, you know, through legislation. Uh, but I, 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 I agree with the goal. And I also think that it, it's happening. I think it's a, I think it's actually not a seismic thing. I think if anything, it'd be a natural little nudge because I think as those audiences that I was talking about earlier have really broadened and tastes have 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 have, have broadened and that I think that um, so have hiring practices and we're not all we're not there yet, but we're on the path. And so uh, you know I I uh, I think. I, I'd be surprised if most films didn't sort of already qualify, you know, more or less. I was, 
I liked it myself because when I was there, I was trying to get diversity into crews and cast and everything, but the studios really didn't push it. And mm -hmm. I think by the Academy pushing it, it's also said to the studios, hey, you better come along yeah. and join us. Yeah, that's clear. You're saying it in a much more clear, you know, concise and clear way. I agree 100% with what you're saying. All right. Brian, did you have a thought that you wanted to? No, well, I, I agree. I very much agree with the intentionality, the spirit of it. Um, I think concurrently, I think we should, you know, are you still on the board of the Academy and all that? No, no. Uh -uh. I'm no. a past pre president emeritus. Yeah. I have no, I have, I have no power there. I really think somehow there should be a coalition of people that help raise money, if that's what it takes. Somebody has to reinstitute the, the importance of the Academy, the importance of Oscars, um, the importance of getting nominated. Because what that does is that then connects to the motivation of artists, why, why they do what they do, and why they want to excel is more based on that becomes then further enriches why why you do things you know it's based on ego and it's based on why something matters in the culture as opposed to just money so i i think anything that can motivate art motivate artists back to the way they were motivated the 80s 90s and 2000s is a really the most important thing we could do to create high quality con content. Great guys. Well, we've got a few questions from the residents. Uh, Jen, can you come on? I think you said there's a, somebody has a comment from uh, a resident. Hello. There you Hi. are. Oh. Um, so Rick Lee, now is your time to call back. Um, before Ripley calls though, we do ask everybody who comes on Organized Chaos a couple of very simple questions. Hawk, are you up for me? Sure, Playing go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Uh, because of the pandemic, the residents and all of the guests who've come on the variety show have answered, what is your favorite movie? Um. My, mine always, I, I it, it shifts around a little bit, but I tend to always go back to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm. Uh, to me, it was, it's funny, it's tragic, it, the performances are brilliant, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's allegorical in a way, um, and, and yet so grounded in humanity, and I just think it's, it's kind of a, a perfect character movie. Brian? You got Godfather 2. Many people have had uh, Godfather 2 on the list. Uh, and I think only one person previously has said One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, so very happy to and that add- That was Michael you. Douglas, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have also added, what's your favorite TV show since we are the motion picture and television fund? Yeah. Um, and while you think of it, I just wanna rem remind everybody, Real Stories, Real Lives tonight at 6.30, going to be streaming on Facebook and YouTube. And one of the big presenters is from one of your projects, Jason Bateman. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Favorite TV show, Brian, what do you think? Arrested Development. <laughs> Full circle. Uh, Full circle. <laughs> um, I guess Sopranos. Sopranos was great. I, and, and so I'm, I, mine was a tie. And since Brian said Sopranos, I'll say, I'll say Breaking Bad. I, I love that show. Yep. <coughs> All right, so we've got Rickley. Did, did that person call in or not? Yeah, Rick, Rickley's on the phone now. Rickley, go ahead. This is a resident, guys. Okay. Hi, Ron. Hi, Brian. Hello. Hi there. Hi. I just wanted to call and say what a great show this is. It's such an enlightenment to listen to you guys talk and I tell your stories. I just love it. You Thank know, you. Wonderful. Is any? I think several people at the home actually have worked on Imagine movies, right? Do we, are any of them uh, there? Yes, at least I I know that we've got um, Alan. Alan had actually worked in uh, management at CBS 
and was there during um, Happy Days and worked more directly on the Encyclopedia Britannica Presents. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and then uh, Marjorie was uh, in the Psycho remake. Oh, <laughs> cool. Oh, that's that's great. me. That, en <laughs> that Encyclopedia Project, I acted. I think, I think that's referring to a series that I, I actually, uh, I, 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 was, I was a guest star. Yes. Um, in, in that, in an episode of that show. Yeah, I, I have, I've got a question. Um, you both love stories and storytelling. I mean, that's so clear and calling your company Imagine is perfect. Um, and it all gets back to writers. And I've read about your impact program, which democratizes the way writers get properties seen. Can you talk a little bit about that? You can go around. Um, well, it impacted it, it. This was this is Brian's initiative because he was in Silicon Valley looking uh, at something called Y Combinator, and we've always talked about you know ways to to change what we view as a kind of damage system, the development system in Hollywood for both movies and television. You know, they call it development hell for a reason. It doesn't really work very efficiently for anyone, and it's very dehumanizing. And so we've talked about it. We've experimented a little bit, never came up with a program that really was a game changer. Brian was in Silicon Valley at this place called Y Combinator, which is a boot camp for startups. And he came away, he called me and said, you know, every movie, every television show is a startup. We could apply this sort of program to talent, to writers. And, you know, it would democratize it. It would, it would give them more leverage and we could really help them jumpstart their projects. And so he began working on it with Tyler Mitchell, who's, who's now the CEO of it. And, uh, and, and, you know, and it, it really, really works. It's a writer's boot camp. Um, and Brian, you should pick up and just tell a little bit more about it. Um, so what it is, it's, uh, it creates access to anyone in the world that wants to apply to impact. And what impact is, is it's, think of it like a funnel and the world is funneling its way into this, going into this funnel. And as you get in, there's a, there is a, there's a, a test you take if you want to get into the, the goal is to get into the boot camp. And the boot camp is eight weeks where you have a mentor, you get a per diem, a living expense, and you're in this environment called the boot camp. And with the mentor, you have to, by the way, promise, you know, your contract is that you have to finish the script that you, you know, you're there to do. And we've had tremendous success. Everybody does finish their script, whether it's a TV script or a movie, and about 70% of them sell. And uh, the first one was, you know, in our first boot camp, which was about two years ago, someone named Godwin from Africa, from Zimbabwe, got in. I think you know the story. And he wrote, you know, he'd never done anything like this. He only had a very small amount of money, $12. And he got in and he wrote a, a script, an animated script that sold a venture, a four-way bidding war to Netflix for about $400,000 or maybe a little more. And then it now being made, so he gets much more money. Um, but that's kind of what impact is. So basically it's your, if you get in, you're, you finish a script and then it's auctioned, like in an auction. And you can build up to be a pretty high number. If you don't get into the boot camp, you're still you can still be in the general population of writers. So I think we have now 13,000 writers that are in this general population. What we do with those writers is we activate them into projects, um, which is a little bit of a longer story. But so they, uh, so it has high value to all people that try to get into it and, and get into this greater population. Okay, well, I've got one last question uh, and I have to ask it because it's my wife, Molly Jordan. Okay. And uh, it's a two part question, but uh, you have to know that my wife is a shrink. Ooh, I love it. Okay. Okay, here we go. That's for Ron. <laughs> is, is there someone either of you would love to meet but haven't yet? And why? And what have you done in your life? 
what have you not done in your life that you still hope uh, or aspire to? Wow. Tough question. Well, that's really hard. Yeah. Aspire to. Uh, Was there someone you'd like to meet? Let's start with that one that you haven't been able to meet. You said, wow, I'd love to. Wow. Well, for me, I want to meet the current Pope. Yeah, yeah that would be fascinating. And I've had a few opportunities to meet the current Pope, but I mean, an experience where I get to talk to him and uh, it doesn't have to be long, but I, I, and I, yeah. So that'd be the current Pope. Great. Ron, you thought of one? Wow. I have so many. I mean, I'm, I'm meeting people every day who I'd like to meet. Uh, uh, but to, to just to, uh, to, to, to grab one sort of out of, th out of thin air, um, man, I, I would, I would say that I, I would really like to have, sit down and have a real, I've met him, but I'd love to have a real conversation with the director in, in Iratu. I, uh, I feel like he's, you know, he's really brilliant. He's, and I, again, I've met him, I get a nice feeling about him. He's very comfortable, but I would really love to sit down and kind of understand, you know, what, what makes him tick, why he chooses what he chooses and why he approaches it the way he does. Cause I think it's very inventive, particular, and again, very human. It's cinema, but it's grounded in this kind of humanity and, and, uh, and character. And is there something, great answers, both of you. Is there, is there something you have not done in your life that you still hope or, or aspire to? Mine's so basic. I've just got a few places I haven't gotten to, even in America. I want, you know, I haven't toured, I haven't been to Alaska. I really want to see what that's like and hike around, see all that. I just, I've, I've, I just haven't done it yet. And there are a few other places in America that I just got to get to. So many places around the world that, of course, I'd be fascinated by. But I feel to grow up, you know, in the United States and and miss, a, you know, a few of these things from Mount Rushmore. Uh, you know, um, to, uh, to uh, Alaska. Um, I like to spend a little more time around the Great Lakes. These areas interest me and the people there interest me. Ryan? Well, it would scare, it would scare me a little bit to do this, but I would uh, probably like to relocate for a year out of our country, like go to Portugal. There's a couple of places I'd like to, I think I'd, I, I, there's a few places that I would like the quaintness of a different type of population and the experience, you know, I like that. I like to have to try to adjust to, you know, for a to, long period of time. Yeah. yeah. For, yeah. Guys, I can't thank you enough. We've gone a thank little you. over schedule, but I just wanted to get as much in it as we thank could. you. This has been so fantastic for the residents and the people in our industry. Uh, and you've given, so many of them jobs for so long. And, you know, the, the mantra of the motion picture and television fund is we take care of our own. And you two have really taken care of our own. Thank so you. thank you so, so much for being here and uh, can't wait to see your new movies, your new television shows, your documentaries. <laughs> and uh, keep going, guys. You're, you're thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thank Hawk. you. Take care.